Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session of the mini symposium on computational social science and digital humanities. Um, my name is Volker Karsorp, and together with Rochelle Thurman, I will be hosting this mini symposium. So this is the first year that SciPy has a slot specifically for computational social science and the digital humanities. And we'd like to thank the organization for this unique opportunity to bring together five exciting speakers um, who will highlight various interesting aspects of those disciplines in relation to Python and SciPy. So time to get started. Um, so you probably know the drill. So please use uh, the Q&A for questions or raise your hand so we can spotlight you. Uh, but first to you, Rochelle. Uh, thank you, Folger. Thanks, um, all of you, for joining us. Uh, our first speaker is Melvin Wavers. Melvin is an assistant professor in digital history at the University of Amsterdam. Melvin, over to you. So, I think you can all see my slides now. Uh, so I'll uh, yeah I see the thumbs up yeah so uh, so welcome everybody I'm happy to uh, kick off this session uh, I will be talking about um, a project I call uh, Event Flow and well, I got a little message that I was interrupted but I I think I'm still there uh, a project called uh, Event Flow uh, in which I examine the relationship between historical events and the way they have impacted the the news. So it's going to be a lot of talk about events, events, and events. And this this project was actually sparked with um, uh, something I, I've seen in historical newspapers. Um, thanks. I'll reshare the slides. They should be back now, right? Someone, yeah, great. So it started with a, um, a discovery of the uh, Dutch coverage. So I'm from the Netherlands, so the coverage in Dutch newspapers on the moon landing. And what struck me is that I could see newspapers sort of building up towards this event, uh, constantly talking about sort of a count of when this event would happen. And after the event, newspapers would still talk about this. Um, so it sort of impacted the news in a certain way. And only recently, we had something similar happen with uh, Sir Richard Branson going up into space that also captivated our uh, uh, collective uh, memory, I think, in our public discourse. But hopefully, it will not have such a big impact as the moon landing. Uh, that would be too much. Uh, exactly, I see someone saying, didn't captivate me. Uh, wouldn't have such big impact on public discourse as the actual moon landing. Um, so a bit of theory behind this project. Um, an event has been described by the historian uh, James Sewell as an occurrence that is remarkable in some way, uh, something that is widely noted and commented on by contemporaries. So it is something that has an impact. Um, at the same time, uh, we see historians such as uh, Robin Wagner Pacifici and her book, What is an Event, actually theorize about the flow and content of actual events. How do they actually work out? And she points out that historians are actually very preoccupied with uh, bounding events in time and space, while she emphasizes the ongoingness of events. And she uses the example of 9-11 to, to talk about this. And what she basically argues is that as an event unfolds, it disrupts the historical flow, the flow of the news, basically. And we can see as something is happening that the public is trying to grasp what is actually happening. Uh, and as events gain traction, as something in the world gains traction, think of, for instance, about the pandemic, we can see uh, historical time, the way that people experience historical time transforming. And after an event, you can also see that the uh, public is reflecting on these events and sometimes even forgets these events. So basically, we can see that in history, you have a, pro a process of remembering and forgetting events and the relationships with, uh, between events. Um, and what I want to do in this project is uh, work on a method to um, detect this unfolding of events. Can we detect events and how they sort of impacted public discourse and the way it captivated people in a very data-driven, bottom-up manner? Um, so the, the main research questions are, do events actually impact the news? Um, and if they actually impacted the news, 
can we uh, detect events in the flow of news? And this is uh, in, in, in time series analysis, some also called event detection. Um, and as you might recall, I just said that events can sort of have a long uh, uh, onset and then a, a sort of a, um, uh, it, it can sort of captivate people for a very long time. And these are particular characteristics of the flow of an event. Um, and can we characterize these events using data? And then we, can we cluster events based on the way they actually involved, uh, evolved in history? So how did I go about doing this? Uh, I took 10 national and regional Dutch newspapers for the period 1950 until 1995. I've harvested these. Uh, using the National Library's API. Uh, and what I got were segmented articles um, with OCR text. So the library used OCR techniques to take the actual paper newspapers and turn them into digitized versions. Um, and so I have all these separate uh, articles. Uh, in addition to these newspapers, I've made a data set of 60 noteworthy events using historical domain knowledge and Wikipedia. And I also uh, took a random sample of 1,000 days between 1950 and 1995. Um, so I got a lot of text, and I needed to pre-process this. Uh, this pre-processing was, was done. The data processing was done using pandas. Um, what I've done with the data is I've removed stop words, I removed punctuation, digits, words shorter than three characters, and words longer than 17 characters. As is often the case with historical documents and OCR is that uh, it doesn't work perfectly. So there can be some gibberish in there. And a lot of the OCR gibberish is either very long concatenated words or very short words. So this is sort of a filter to get rid of that, uh, uh, that data. Um, I lemmatize the words using the uh, National Language Processing Toolkit, SPACI. And then I trained the topic model uh, using LDA, uh, using the mallet wrapper in Gensim. Um, so a lot of NLP tools. And why I've actually done this is to reduce the complexity of all the information that is stored in these newspapers. So it's basically a dimensionality reduction uh, method. Um, and this has left me with a, uh, a matrix of um, for every single document and the probability of, uh, of a topic. Uh, so the matrix uh, is, is described here. Um, and the document in this case is a concatenation of all the articles on the front page. This is important to remember that I'm working with front pages to model this impact of events on the news. So is something actually being uh, discussed in the front pages? Um, so I have these probability distributions, uh, these topics uh, of the front pages. And uh, what is then the actual method that I'm going to use to, um, to analyze the impact that events have on the flow of information? Uh, I'm doing this using relative entropy. And basically what I do is I take one uh, topic uh, distribution from one front page and I compare it to uh, another front page. And um, if I can explain one front page with the other, there's not a lot of change. So there's not a lot of surprise, basically. So they're basically talking about the same thing. There's not a lot of entropy uh, between these pages. Um, and in this project, I've adapted a method that has been introduced in an article by Barron et al. in 2018 where they basically compare uh, a political speeches from one day to the other. Uh, but what I have introduced here is, uh, is jumps. So rather than comparing uh, one day to another, I've taken a set of days, uh, so a window of front pages, say seven uh, days of front pages. And then I've taken a jump either in the future or in the past. And I've then calculated the relative entropy between these, uh, this window of front pages to something 10 days in the future, 15 days in the future, 20 days in the future, up until 1,500 days in the future and 1,500 days in the past. Um, I've provided the formulas here, a little bit of Python code to, uh, to show how I've calculated all these relative entropies. Um, and what this yields is just a very big matrix where you compare the front pages 
for every single day to a front page uh, in a range of zero until 1500 in the future and 1500 days in the past. So a lot of talking, a lot of theory. Uh, what does this actually yield us and how does it relate back to these uh, event flows? Um, this is what we get when we actually plot uh, this jumping and this relative entropy. So what we see here is uh, events in one uh, newspaper, one national newspaper in the Netherlands. And basically, if you uh, take a look at the uh, first graph in the middle on the x-axis at the zero, that's basically the date on which the event happened. And to the right of the zero, it's days in the future, and to the left of the zero is days in the past. So basically what we see here is how much surprise was there compared to that day of the event, to that day in the future, or that day in the past. Um, so in the case of um, uh, uh, the Suez crisis, we see that there's sort of an anticipation, and then the debate on the front page narrows down. The, people are constantly talking about the same thing as represented in this topic structure. And after the event, there is sort of a slow decay again, where there is an increase in entropy again, and people start going back into the regular uh, flow of the news. Um, but what we see when we look at these graphs is that they, they have sort of a, a distinct trajectory. They're not all the same. Um, for instance, if you look at the third one, it's uh, uh, the Nigerian civil war, where we have sort of a very slow uh, decay back into the normal. Um, so what I, what I want to do with these event flows is think of a way to actually compare these um, between newspapers and between events. Because um, what we see here is that this method actually uh, offers a, method, a, a way to detect changes in the flow of information. But can we say something about uh, what is happening between newspapers or between events? Um, so the comparison of event flows. Yesterday, um, there was already a talk uh, on the StumPy uh, time series analysis uh, library. Um, where similar things were, were discussed. Um, what I have done in this, in this paper is uh, use the method that is based on dynamic time warping. And dynamic time warping is a way to sort of align two time series that uh, are either not of similar length or have events in the time series appear at different moments. Uh, and what this dynamic time warping allows me to do is, for instance, compare uh, the moon landing in one newspaper to the moon landing in another, and then see how similar are these time series between these two newspapers. Um, but what I discovered is actually that it was quite noisy because there was a lot of uh, uh, local changes and, and global changes. Uh, so what I've then done is actually use the method called dynamic time warping barycenter averaging that allows you to calculate an average time series. So what we see here, and this is for the moon landing, um, I basically calculated the average time series uh, across these 10 newspapers. So the red line in the, uh, in the plot shows you the average uh, calculated over these 10 newspapers. And in the uh, bright colors in the background, these are all the different uh, newspapers. So what this allows me to do is for an event to calculate a sort of average uh, representation of uh, how it impacted the news. And what that also allows me to then do is take an average and uh, calculate how different um, one newspaper is to the average, how deviant is one newspaper. Um, and in this first example, um, I sort of set up a baseline where I've taken these um, 1,000 random dates uh, between 1950 and 1995. And for every single day, I calculated the average time series using the, uh, the DBA method, and calculated the distance for each newspaper to that average. Um, and what we see here is that, uh, especially the newspaper in gray, uh, is, actually, is deviating strongly from other newspapers. So they have a very different way of reporting. Events in the world impact uh, that newspaper in a very different way than the others. Um, and this is, this is something that, that fits the literature. It's a very uh, conservative, almost tabloid-like newspaper that, that benefits from constantly generating news. They sort of uh, 
uh, were the first in the Netherlands to to make news in this sort of method. So it it fits that they that they actually deviate from the others. Um, in the second step, what I've done is. Um, for this list of 60 events that I have found, I've also calculated for every single event, the average time series, and uh, for every newspaper, then how uh, how much distance does it have to this average? Um, and um, what we see here is, and this is uh, um, sorted based on mean distance, is that for some events, and those are the ones in black, uh, newspapers are, are all quite close to the average. So there's a, there's a lot of uniformity in the way they report on this event. So for instance, on the Suez crisis, on the oil crisis, uh, the Nigerian civil war, the fall of Saigon and the moon landing, uh, the, there, was, there was sort of a uh, consensus in the way of reporting. Uh, but what we also see is on the bottom, and that's again this Telegraph newspaper that I just mentioned, the one that was more tabloid-like, uh, we see that that one actually deviates very strongly. Uh, uh, for many events, it has a very particular way of, of um, uh, reporting. Uh, and that there is also a cluster of newspapers that, that are much more aligned. Um, and these are often seen as, as sort of the more liberal newspapers in the Netherlands. So this basically shows uh, that, that you can use this method to uh, investigate uh, differences between events, but also between these newspapers. Um, and now to the final step. Um, I wanted to investigate whether we can also uh, cluster these event flows that I've presented earlier uh, based on their characteristics. Are there typical ways in which events ha have impacted public discourse? Uh, similar to, to the uh, points that are made in the book that I showed uh, on the second slide uh, on what is an event. Um, and basically the, the uh, uh, DBA method that I, that I showed, um, uh, that's from a, a, a library called TS Learn, which also offers a method to use k-means clustering to uh, cluster all these D, uh, DBA averages and then uh, present a... Um, uh, uh, an optimal clustering uh, um, with, with these time series. Um, but uh, we also compare this to our own method, a more uh, the uh, an hierarchical method, an algor uh, agglomerative uh, clustering method. Uh, and what we've done here is uh, basically take these event flows uh, for a window size of 28 days in the future and 28 days in the past. Uh, we made a distant matrix. Uh, by calculating a pairwise uh, uh, dynamic time warping distance between all the events. Uh, and then we've done a grid search uh, through different clustering uh, uh, parameters. So uh, different clustering methods, uh, complete linkage, etc. The, the typical ones that you can find in, in the uh, side by clustering uh, method. Uh, and then we looked for the ones that had a high silhouette score. Uh, so we, we could sort of determine how many clusters we actually wanted. Um, and what, what we actually found is, uh, and that, that's what you can see in the slides here, is if we projected this using UMAP, uh, we could see that the hierarchical clustering was actually uh, had much better separation than the k-means method that was offered in TS Learn. Um, so this showed us that, um, well, well, the clusters were basically better. Uh, but it also showed us that uh, this method was a bit better to explain what was actually going on. And we can see this in the, uh, in the next slide. Um, so what we see here is the archetypical clusters um, that we found. And this helps us to see which clusters are actually closer to each other uh, than others. Uh, and we found actually in the data set that we used um, with these 60 events that there were uh, uh, the optimal cluster size was five. And uh, I won't go uh, into too much detail in all these clusters, but I think it's noteworthy here that um, there are clusters that have sort of a, uh, a decline going down, um, uh, a downward slope before the event. We can see this in cluster one and in cluster two. And then there's also sort of a retention after the event has taken place. Um, Whereas in cluster three, it's very noisy. There's something happening, but it, it returns to uh, to daily business quite uh, quite quickly. 
Um, whereas for the fourth and the fifth cluster, you can see that it's actually a reverse of the first two. So the, uh, there's sort of an anticipation of the event, the actual event happens, and then there is a release again. Uh, and in the fifth one, it's more balanced than the fourth one. So there's, and that is, uh, for instance, with the moon landing, we uh, fits into cluster five, where you have a slow anticipation of the event, and after it happens, uh, uh, then people still talk about it, and then it's slowly forgotten. Um, and what you can also do uh, using these clusters, you can also use them as a search method. Uh, so for this, I've used 60 clusters that I've, uh, or 60 events that I've uh, determined. But I can also say, uh, take cluster five, the archetypical plot of cluster five, and find front pages that fit this profile. Uh, and so this could be sort of a way to, to find uh, uh, moments in newspaper discourse that are not remembered as such, that are not canonized. Uh, the moon landing, of course, we all remember, but maybe Richard Branson in maybe 10 years, maybe five months, we have already forgotten. So this could be a method to actually um, uh, detect these events. Um, before I, I uh, close off some concluding remarks, uh, what I've presented is a method to measure how events impacted newspaper discourse. Um, a way to compare the impact across events and newspapers. Uh, and using uh, hierarchical clustering, um, we have discovered five archetypical event flows. Um, and what I want to do in future work is for this uh, research, we've only looked at the front pages and how the front pages discuss an event, but events could also propagate um, uh, throughout the newspapers. People could talk about something in the front pages, maybe it goes into the fifth, sixth page and then goes back again, or it could start up somewhere in the back and head uh, to the front pages. Um, and the second thing I want to do with future work is uh, investigate this disjunction between public memory of events and the actual impact that they had, uh, and, and how this relates to the canonization of events. Um, um, so, that's, so that's basically my, my talk. Um, this was a collaborative effort, uh, effort with two other people, Jan Koskan and Christopher Nielbo at Aarhus University, whom I uh, really want to thank. Uh, I want to thank all the developers that made all this uh, great software available for me to work with. Uh, and again, thanks to the organizers. Uh, for setting up this uh, great event. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Melvin. That was really interesting. Um, just as a reminder, if you have a, a question for Melvin, please put it in the Q&A or raise your hand. Uh, we already have a, a few questions. Um, one is asking if there's a GitHub repo um, and or a paper preprint that's associated with this project that you could share, Melvin. Uh, the, the paper is currently under review. Um, once I have the reviews, I, I will share the, uh, the archive as well as the, uh, the GitHub. Um, so hopefully in a, a month's time or so, uh, I, will, I hope we'll be able to share it. Great. Um, Michelle asks, do you think that your techniques can be adapted to follow um, slash debunk stories or content um, and how they correlate to newspaper uh, sponsors, governance, editorial staff? Um, so let's see, um, about the, um, debunking, um, I, I think that is, uh, debunking is very much sort of a, a content analysis perhaps. Um, and what I do here is more, uh, a more general method to see how it has actually impacted. Uh, one thing that I could think of is, um, if you would combine this with other data uh, um, sources to see if something uh, popped up on Reddit or uh, 4chan, for instance, and if it would then propagate into more public discourse where these, maybe for fake news, where these types of stories could actually dominate uh, the news. Um, and and in, in terms of governance structures, uh, one interesting thing that I've seen is there was one newspaper that was actually deviating from the others and then returned. 
And the, the point where it actually returned was when the editorial staff changed. It merged with a different newspaper. And I think there were some changes made then in the direction of the newspaper. So it, it was more following the, the mainstream uh, newspapers. But this, of course, only runs until 1995. It would be interesting to extend this also to contemporary newspapers, where I think there's much more deviance between uh, media nowadays. Great. Um, Michelle also asks about these matrices. I would imagine that they are extremely large matrices. Um, and I think she's asking about how sparse they are or if you use any kind of um, you know, sparsity threshold uh, to manage these. Uh, no, and what I've, do, what I've done now is basically um, calculated every single day into the future. But of course, there's overlap between one, one point and maybe 50 year or uh, 50 days in the future is similar to 50 days in the future taking that point and going 50 days back so there's all these overlaps that i haven't actually uh, uh removed from uh from the data and basically uh, what what i've done is i, I just done a uh, multi-processing and and just let it go and it was it took some time it didn't take too long so i didn't uh, 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 take the time to actually figure out how to make it sparser. Uh, perhaps afterwards that could also be done. I didn't do it on the fly, actually. OK, great. I'm going to go to a question um, from Mike. Um, so he uh, asks if we could use your technique and use these plots to pinpoint the peak date um, of events, especially those that occur over a long period of time. Interesting question, Mike. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Because um, now I've I've sort of um, linked an event to a certain date, such as the oil crisis. And of course, the oil crisis doesn't, you cannot really pinpoint it to one day. There are also these sub events within this larger event. So in a way, you could go over this event and see where the, uh, the valleys or the peaks, if you would reverse the graph, are highest. So that could uh, uh detect uh also within a larger event if there's sort of uh, uh change points there uh, as well and and similarly Great. there's also cyclical things in events uh for instance the murder of jfk when his brother was murdered a couple months later you can actually see that newspapers are writing about jfk again uh i'm, I'm not sure how, how far in the future it was uh, a couple of months i think um but but so you can also use this as a method to to figure out when newspapers started talking about something again, uh, also in the case of centen uh, centennials and, and stuff like that. Yeah, or the, uh, de recent developments, kind of in an ongoing story. Um, Adam asks if you've noticed any trends or commonalities in the events within a cluster. So um, I'm imagine that uh, this refers to certain kinds of content. Like, are there certain kinds of stories um, that have a particular shape in how they unfold? Um, I, so for now, I didn't look at the, um, the actual, um, ways they've, uh, evolved, but I did look at the topic structure. So what I could see is that, um, for instance, a certain event had certain topics associated with it, but you could also then, uh, basically look at the probability if one topic appeared, if another topic also appeared, and you could see sometimes that after certain events, um, these, these conditional probabilities would change. So there would be linkages between topic types after an event that weren't there before it was actually happening. Um, so that, that is a way to perhaps untangle some of the uh, particular events within the cluster as well. Um, but I think there's also uh, other kinds of time series methods that you could then use to further untangle what is happening within such a cluster, I think. Mm. So I think we probably have time um, for one more question, if we can do it fast, um, uh, which is uh, Isa's question. Um, you know, can we adapt this method uh, to do something that kind of cross country analysis uh, to perhaps better understand how public opinion um, evol evolves differently or how different events might have different impact? Um. Yeah, definitely, and I, and I um, this the 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 people I'm collaborating with at Aarhus University, they're actually doing similar things to the uh, reporting on the pandemic in the Scandinavian countries, and they see very clear differences in when the lockdown occurs, how newspapers respond in Sweden compared to Denmark or Norway. Um, so so yeah, definitely, and and also for newspapers, uh, this would work. Unfortunately, for historical newspapers. 
in the Netherlands, they're quite easy to get hold of. But for a lot of other countries, there's all kinds of copyright issues that makes it quite difficult to, to get uh, historical data for such a long period. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it kind of is easy question that reminded me a little bit of the outrage fatigue um, that a lot of people talk about in the United States. It'd be interesting to see um, if that is reflected uh, in the data with these kinds of methods. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Melvin, um, for the fascinating uh, talk and fascinating project. Um, we're going to wrap this session up, uh, but I hope to see everyone um, at our next session in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you all.